Je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Uh, mon nom est Will Straw, je suis directeur de l'Institut d'études canadiennes de McGill, and it's good to see so many people here on, well, it's not a hot or a cold evening, it's just a <laughs> in-between kind of evening. Um, but I'd like to welcome you all um, to the William R. Eakin Lecture. And this year, we're particularly lucky at the Institute um, to have two Eakin Fellows, Karen Fricker, who was with us this fall and who will be speaking to us in a moment, and in the winter, Claire Campbell from Dalhousie University, who will be joining us. Now, my colleague Aaron Hurley is going to introduce tonight's speaker in just a minute, but first I'd like to say a few words um, on behalf of myself, of the Institute, and of the Faculty of Arts um, as a whole. I'd like to say a special thank you to the Eakin family for their generous and their ongoing contributions um, to the university. I'm looking for Gail Eakin in your back. Okay. <laughs> um, and in particular, the creation of the Eakin Visiting Fellowship in Canadian Studies, which is in honor of William R. Eakin, has brought so far nine scholars to the Institute for one or two um, terms. I'm not going to list them all. The first was Kerry Morgan, um, whose work is in areas similar to those of tonight's. We've had Judy Rebick, we've had Elspeth Cameron, we've had Ian McKay. Um, I think of all of the sort of things that go on within the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, receiving the Eakin Fellows every year, they teach courses, integrating them is one of the great, great uh, riches and pleasures um, for me. And this is, of course, would not have been possible without the generous support of the Eakin um, family. And so I'd like to thank, again, on behalf of myself, the Faculty of Arts, and MISC, um, the family, for its long-standing um, commitment to McGill over the years. And we're particularly grateful tonight to hear what Karen Fricker has been working on since she's been at the Institute since August, because I know she's been working very, 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 very hard, or so she told me. Um, I'm happy now to invite Erin Hurley, Professor of Contemporary Performance Theory in the Department of English at McGill, who has an interest in Quebecois theater, cultural performance, theater historiography, performance studies, dramatic theory, 20th century theater, feminist and LGBTQ theater, affect, Celine Dion, Expo 67, um, the last three I just made up, um, to introduce Karen more thoroughly. So, Professor Hurley. Hello, so this semester's, or this year's Eakin Fellow, Dr. Karen Fricker, is a scholar of contemporary theatre and performance, and an active theatre critic for such publications as Variety, The Guardian, The Irish Times, The New York Times, CBC, BBC, et j'en passe, um, and also, um, saliently, uh, the founding editor-in-chief of Irish Theatre magazine, which she co-founded, um, and has since become the major organ for Irish theatre criticism. Um, indeed, it was through her journalistic practice that she first encountered the work of Roberta Page, whose aesthetics are the subject of her lecture tonight. She moved from critic to observer of Lepage's creative process when she sat in on the rehearsals for his epic theater piece of the 1990s, The Seven Streams of the River Ota. And this, uh, her sitting in on the rehearsal process resulted then in the publication of the play script. Since that time, through a series of articles um, engaging Lepage's work in, among other places, Globe, uh, Revue Internationale d'Études Québécoises, in L'Annuaire Théâtrale, and in Contemporary Theatre Review, among others. She's emerged as one of the more important critics of this multivalent Québécois artist, consistently assessing the effects and opportunities of globalization on Lepage's imaginary, his aesthetics, and his production and distribution processes. Her forthcoming book, Making Theatre Global, Roberta Page's original stage productions from Manchester University Press, is eagerly anticipated by Canadianists, Québécists, and theatre scholars. It's from this book project that she'll speak today. I would be remiss, however, to not mention Dr. Fricker's AHRC-funded research project called Eurovision and the New Europe Research Network, which she co-directed with Milia Gluovic at the University of Warwick. This project, which has examined the Eurovision Song Contest as a performative expression of Europeanness and different sets of modern identities, is about to reach its end, sadly, um, <clears throat> in the winter uh, 2013 publication of the edited volume Performing the New Europe, Identity, 
feelings, and politics in the Eurovision Song Contest. Issues of identity, global flows, and performance raised by Eurovi Eurovision and Lepage's work form the core of her current course in Canadian studies, performing Quebec in the global age. Lately of Royal Holloway, University of London, where she was lecturer in contemporary performance, Dr. Fricker will join the Department of Dramatic Arts at Brock University in January 2013. It's a great pleasure indeed for me to introduce my good friend and my esteemed colleague, Karen Fricker, to whose sophisticated and nuanced critical voice I now cede the floor. Karen. Thank you, Erin, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for being here to hear me speak about Robert Lepage's work. This talk, as Erin mentioned, is adapted from a chapter from my forthcoming book, Making Theatre Global, which is being published by Manchester University Press. Before I get started with the lecture, though, I would like to say how much I'm benefiting from my term here as Econ Visiting Scholar at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. And like Will, I would like to thank the Econ family for their support of this fellowship. I would also like to acknowledge the support of all the faculty and staff of MISC, in particular Will Straw, the director, who in addition to being a pioneer in theorizing scenes, is also an expert in creating them. Under his direction, MISC is never less than a stimulating, productive, and dare I say fun place to work. Finally, I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to be teaching McGill undergraduates during my time here, many of whom are here today. Uh, their, your intelligence, engagement, and openness is an inspiration and has helped me see Quebec culture in new and hopeful ways. And so, to the subject at hand. Not two weeks ago, the journalist Pia Catton said in a Wall Street Journal article that in terms of theater and performance, quote, we are living in an era defined by the Canadian director and multidisciplinary artist Robert Lepage. Like it or not, he's probably the single most versatile and visionary voice working across the genres today. End quote. Lepage has also been called by the London Telegraph the planet's most venerated director. So what is it about Lepage's creative contribution that makes it so significant? That's the question that critics, scholars, and theater lovers have been chasing for decades and that we're going to continue to be batting around for decades to come. My central argument today is that Lepage's theater is significant in no small part because it is cinematic. This is a term that has been used to describe Lepage's work by many journalists and some scholars. And my specific argument, building on the, specific, the existing scholarship, is that the cinematic qualities of Lepage's work rest primarily, primarily in the ways he adopts the formal languages of film to construct and deliver stories on stage, thus inviting audiences to read his work like they read films. Borrowing and reworking filmic techniques for the stage is Lepage's means of keeping theater in step with changes in human perception that come about with shifts in the media landscape. In doing this, Lepage contributes to a process of remediation in which the languages of one media form, in this case cinema, are adopted and adapted into another media context, in this case theater. The cinematic technique that is most central to Lepage's theater making is montage which Lev Manovich has called the key 20th century technology for creating fake realities. As I'll argue, one of Lepage's most significant formal innovations is the exploitation of the three-dimensional nature of the stage space to create spatial montage techniques which allow him to deliver complex and layered narratives. Delivering this argument requires some groundwork in media and cultural theory, which might sound like a little bit heavy going up front. So let's ease our way in, first of all, by brief, briefly establishing Lepage's overall affinity for the cinema. References to films and filmmaking abound in Lepage's productions on many levels. Many of his characters on and off stage are involved in film. Mark, whose death spurs the action of the production Vinci, was an idealistic filmmaker. Polygraph is an extended exploration of the ethics of making film about real life crimes, which Lepage first made as a stage play and then, perhaps paradoxically, adapted into a film. It is implied that Philippe, the failing academic in the far side of the moon, may have a future in film or video making. And here you see him on his moped driving through the Plains of Abraham with his video camera strapped to his handlebars. Uh, 
One of the central figures in Lip Sync, Jeremy, sorry, is a filmmaker. And one of the production's nine sections depicts the behind the scenes mayhem on his set. That's what you see here. Many of Lepage's productions contain stylistic references to the work of major filmmakers. Le Beau Extreme, a piece which Lepage co-directed with Michel Nadeau in 1986, was inspired by Bergman's The Seventh Seal. His early 1990s productions of Coriolan and Macbeth were greeted by critics as stylistic homages to Fellini and Kurosawa, respectively. René's Hiroshima Mon Amour was a source of inspiration for Lepage's 1990s epic, The Seven Streams of the River Ota, which in its earliest iterations included a section set in the milieu of the Perry Nouvelle Vague, and that's what that scene is depicting. In the late 80s and early 90s, Lepage was particularly influenced by the legate of the poet, dramatist, and filmmaker Jean Cocteau, most evidently in the solo piece Needles and Opium. And of course, Lepage is himself a filmmaker. He made five films in the 1990s and early 2000s. The best received and most accomplished of these, Le Confessionnel, is a metafilmic homage to Alfred Hitchcock. An in-depth investigation of these references is not my goal here. That goal is rather to establish Lepage's strong interest in films, filmmakers, and in particular the languages and techniques of cinema. For Lepage, taking these languages on board is essential for the relevance and ongoing future of theater practices. They are a key tool in his attempts to evoke in his work the complex, lived reality of contemporary Western culture. As Lepage said in 2007, quote, the only way that theater can evolve, can stay alive, is to embrace the vocabulary of other ways of telling stories. People think fast today. They're trained by the TV, by the language of cinema, by the web and the clip. Artists can tell stories all kinds of ways these days, so the public's narrative vocabulary is very sophisticated. But then there's theater, and it's a very metonymic way of telling stories. In theater, we make things very simple. You open the door, you close the door. We have to create a theatrical space that is not just constructed from theatrical scenography. We have to create a cinematic scenography, too. Underlying Lepage's statements here is an understanding of the role in media in shaping human perception that echoes that of many cultural scholars who have long argued that the way we see the world is not a transhistorical given, but rather shaped by conditions of history and culture. As the Canadian media, media theorist Marshall McLuhan famously argued, the medium in which an idea or expression is conveyed fundamentally shapes that communication. Mediation, in McLuhan's words, translates and transforms the sender, the receiver, and the message. Media are thus, as Peter Banish has argued, by no means a neutral means to communicate or express something, but shape what can be thought, said, and stated at all times. And, another key point, media are in a constant state of progression. The medium that shapes one era's perceptions will not be the same as that which shapes the next era's. Jay Bolter and Richard Grusin have argued that the progression from one media form to another is not a series of ruptures, but is rather a progression, a series of transformations, as one media form defines itself by borrowing the conventions of the previous and transforming them into something new. Film borrowed much of its representational language from theater, and the language of human-computer interface in turn, bar in turn borrows much of its formal language and logic from cinema. This progress from one media form to another is what Bolter and Grusin have usefully termed remediation. Film was, in Manovich's argument, the key representational form of the 20th century, and its formal language is providing the building blocks for the next epical medial turn to the digital. I cite Manovich here. Rather than being one cultural language among, language among others, cinema is the cultural interface, a toolbox for all cultural communication overtaking the printed word. Cinematic means of perception, of connecting time and space, of representing human memory, thinking, and emotion have become a way of work and a way of life for millions in the computer age." End quote. Throughout the 20th century, however, mainstream theater has lagged behind the representational innovations Manovich chron chronicles, hewing to a fixed singular point of view, linear narrative conventions, and the naturalistic representation of space. Susan Sontag famously acknowledged as much when in 1966 she argued that, quote, 
The theater's capabilities for manipulating time and space are simply much cruder and more labored than films." End quote. While it is not clear that Lepage is aware of Sontag's dismissal of the formal capabilities of theater, it is tempting to read his career as an ongoing attempt to prove her wrong. He has sought new ways of manipulating time and space and theater by remediating cinematic techniques, thus challenging Arnold Aronson's definition of theater as a single focus linear event. As I mentioned, other scholars have offered useful accounts of some of the ways that Lepage has brought techniques from the cinema to his stage productions. Ludovic Fouquet, for example, notes Lepage's tendency to frame stage action in the proscenium arch or in constructed inner frames that evoke the shape of the cinema screen, as in the scene from River Ota. Fouquet also points out Lepage's use of screen opening and closing credits in his stage productions and his evocation of shifts of, of perspective and point of view. With or without the use of a camera, Fouquet argues, the spectator's gaze in Lepage's productions does not depend on her placement in relationship to the stage. And this is a crucial point. Our cinema, cinema trained perceptual apparati are very used to the experience of moving from space to space, location to location, point of view of point of view, in the course of a narrative. The fact that a film is constructed in advance of our watching it means that the filmmaker can draw together different places, time frames, and perspectives and guide us through them. In mainstream Western theater, however, spectators sit in one place looking at a single space where the action happens, just like you're sort of looking at me right now. This has not prevented theater artists from setting work in multiple locations or having time jump forward and backward between scenes, but this traditionally requires physical set changes and or having characters cue the audience that the location has shifted, as in Act Two of As You Like It, when Rosalind usefully comments, well, this is the Forest of Arden. <laughs> Lepage has worked throughout his career to develop formal strategies to, by which to move beyond the time and space bound nature of traditional Western theater. The key cinematic tool that he brings to this task is montage. Montage is a contested term in cinema studies, and there are many ways of defining and exploring it. Cinematic montage is itself a remediation, in that the Soviet director Sergei Eisenstein first developed the technique he called the montage of attractions in his work as a theater director. The cineasts among you will have already noted that nod to Eisenstein in the title of my presentation today. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm particularly interested in the distinction that Manovich makes between temporal and spatial montage. Temporal montage is the most recognizable way of cutting images together in film in which frames are placed in a sequence so that separate realities form consecutive moments in time. This can be more or less jarring or more or less politicized depending on the motivation of the filmmaker. The Odessa step sequence in Eisenstein's Potemkin is perhaps the most famous use of montage to deliver an ideological message via the juxtaposition of images of innocence and violence and the variation of close-ups close with long shots. On the other, a political hand, temporal montages have become a mainstay of Hollywood film used to contract a storyline or plot sequence that might occupy weeks in real life into a few minutes of screen time. Think of the falling in love montage from a romantic comedy or the sports montage in the likes of Rocky. So before you see this image, you see Rocky training, sweating, sparring, falling down, getting up before he emerges victorious on the steps of the Philadelphia Arts Museum to the strains of Gonna Fly Now. Because film is a sequential horizontal medium, images must necessarily appear frame after frame. It lends itself to temporal montage in which images are placed one after the other. Spatial montage, or montage within a shot by contrast, involves a number of images appearing on screen at the same time. This technique, which Manovich argues is the new paradigm for screen storytelling in the digital era, attempts to push beyond the inherently sequential nature of film to offer the impression of multiple time periods and spaces overlapping and intersecting in the same field. Rel relatively unfamiliar in 20th century popular cinema, spatial montage appears in avant-garde and auteur-driven films in the form of superimpositions, rear screen projection shots, and deep focus effects, such as this one in Citizen Kane. In order to really understand what's going on in the shot, you've got to look in the full depth of the shot to what's going on in the background. <laughs> 
Spatial montage found its way into mainstream culture largely by pop music videos, and we see it emerging in 20th, 21st century popular culture via split screen effects in television series such as 24 and MI5. And the split screen effects arrival into mainstream culture was enshrined by the obligatory formal quotation in The Simpsons. The three-dimensional nature of the stage space is more naturally geared to spatial montage than is film because action does not necessarily have to unroll sequentially but can happen simultaneously. Lepage exploits this fact via the creation of spatial montage techniques that allow him to place in proximity images and ideas which are not necessarily temporally or spatially connected and might not instantly seem to be logically related but which the piece overall is positing as metaphorically linked. As Lepage articulates it, his gravitation towards filmic techniques is a response to the limitations in terms of representation and perspective of traditional Western stagings. Here is what he said about this to McGill theater professor Dennis Salter in 1993, quote, the perspective in theater tends to be so expansive or wide-ranging that I find it hard to create intimate close-ups, blow-ups of small details, and ways to isolate things, to concentrate fully on them. However, the frame around the theatrical action allows me to create these filmic effects without a huge budget. You can position a character downstage saying such and such, while upstage behind him you can position a big icon which is suggesting something altogether different." End quote. The technique he describes here, simultaneously presenting, or if you will, superimposing, two characters, activities, and or scenic elements on stage, and thus suggesting a relationship between them, is what I am calling spatial montage in this instance. The technique helps him to construct layered narratives in which a story of contemporary individuals struggling for self-expression and self-realization is paralleled by a broader story about a larger historical phenomenon, figure, or set of ideas. It is left to spectators to experience and then decode how the accumulating montage adds up to larger meanings. As Lepage understands it, most storytelling is horizontal, beginning, middle, and end. Things happen in a certain order, whereas, I'm quoting him here, metaphorical storytelling is when you've seen a piece of theater and you say, there was this thing going on, but at the same time there was another level that's going on. And then there's this other level and things to be connected, seem to be connected in a vertical way. Things are piling up, end quote. And for me, I struggled for a long time with Lepage's assertion that his work was vertical. I just didn't get it. And it was really thinking about it through this way that I realized that for me what works is rather than thinking of vertical like this, think of vertical like this. That it's about seeing the layers progressing that way as opposed to up. So narrative, there are narratives that go this way and there are narratives that are stacked that way. In this formulation, Storytelling is driven less by forward-moving time along a horizontal axis than by the introduction of images and characters who suggest multiple meanings and complex significance. Roman Jakobson referred to such metaphoric structural techniques as exercising the poetic function of language, a reading of poetic that chimes with Lepage's own usage of the word, which, as Andy Lavender has suggested, means that there is a frisson in two or more things happening at once, a theater of meta metaphor or simultaneity. Through this verticality or layering effect, Lepage exploits theater's unique qualities of liveness and three-dimensionality to make montage do representational, symbolic, and affective work not necessarily achievable in screamed forms of representation, asserts the theater person. So to finish, I want to look at two examples of this technique, which means I need to ask John to come from the camera to help me plug in the audio. There's his cue. From the productions that put Lepage's name on the map back in the 1980s, those productions are the Dragons Trilogy and Vinci. The central metaphor in the Dragons Trilogy is first embodied in the scene called OK, on change, OK, let's change, which I'm going to show you a bit of here. This clip is from the 2003 revival of that production. The section is performed almost completely in French and did not have supertitles even when it was performed in an Anglophone market. The girls Jean and Françoise, the production's central characters, are playing a game in which they use shoeboxes to stand in for the buildings on the main street in the Saint-Roch area of Quebec City where they live. They take on the voices of the shopkeepers themselves and members of their family as a further part of this play-acting game. When a stranger arrives on the scene, as you'll see, it's the first the audience have seen of him. 
exhilarating switch of perspective via the intercutting of spatial realities. The world that the girls are playing at evoking with this game, knocking on the door, speaking, um, in, in their imaginary world materializes as the English shoe salesman Crawford arrives in their town in search of the shop called Pettigrew that he's there to buy. The street in their game overlaps with and becomes the real street. The two scenes, the girls' game and Crawford's arrival in the neighborhood, are overlaid on each other, and the bigger production the story is telling of the opening up of Quebec via immigration to new cultures is launched. As the production continues, the metaphor extends. The story of Jeanne and Françoise, who we met there as girls, as they grow up, interact with Crawford, the Chinese laundryman Wong, who we saw there, and the different cultures we bring with them becomes the larger narrative of the story. As they and their families move westward across Canada from Quebec City to Toronto to Vancouver, a much broader narrative is suggested of Quebec's shift from an insular culture to one negotiating difference in interacting with the world. Another foundational example of Lepage's use of spatial montage happens in the first fully staged scene of Vinci called Décalage or Takeoff. In this monologue, the young photographer Philippe is in his psychiatrist's office talking about his current creative project, which is to photograph porcelain bathroom features. I apologize for the quality of the video you're about to see. It's taken from a VHS tape, but it is quite literally all that remains of this production. And this is um, Lepage himself performing. Je voulais exprimer avec cette photo-là qu'on vit dans un univers qui est froid. Bon, C'est sûr qu'il reste encore un peu de chaleur humaine entre les êtres humains, mais on a quand même trouvé le moyen de s'entourer de matériaux qui peuvent se bon, C'est sûr que si mon message avait été clair depuis le départ, je ne me serais jamais fait téléphoner par le gérant du drone international qui veut servir de mes photos pour la promotion de l'intérêt. <rire> Ce qui est paradoxal et encore une fois très contradictoire, c'est que j'ai accepté le coup. Le lendemain, j'étais dans ma propre salle de bain, devant mon propre écran, et je suis en train de m'avancer. Je me suis demandé si la personne devant moi était réellement un artiste. Si j'avais tout à faire un espèce de charlatan. Finalement, tout ça est lié à une peur dont j'ai souvent été question dans une session psychanalytique. Vous savez, la peur que j'ai de me compromettre, d'aller jusqu'au bout des choses que j'ai à dire. La peur de dessiner. scene and the sound and other technical effects do not match the content of his speech. I'll unpack it a little bit for those of you who don't speak French. Philippe is talking about his feelings of being a charlatan and not a real artist because he sold his work for commercial purposes. But the physical storytelling is doing something completely different. It's evoking a plane journey with Lepage himself embodying the takeoff and the in-flight meal just by the use of his body and some sound and visual effects and a few simple props. In the final lines of the monologue, after you see him go through the flight, he spins around, you hear landing noises, he puts his feet down, and then he announces, still in the mode of speaking to a psychoanalyst, that he has found therapy a complete waste of time, and that he's going to take the money that he was going to use to spend on further therapy sessions and go on a trip to Europe. And he says the line, I have a flight to London next week. This scene is thus a spatial montage intercutting two related subsequent pieces of action. The therapy session in which Philippe reveals he is soon to travel to London 
and the flight itself, communicated simultaneously via the performer's body and some technical effects. This is a spatio-temporal overlapping that would not have been possible in a single screen filmic context. Plot is efficiently conveyed and two actions, psychotherapy and travel, are overlaid with each other and the audience is invited to see them as connected. As the production continues and spectators follow Philippe's travels through Europe and his internal path towards self-realization, the production's central metaphor is extended. Physical journeying is like and promotes the journey to self-knowledge. The small-scale story of Philippe's search for self-realization is likened in the production to Leonardo da Vinci's attempts to capture reality through representation, hence the title, Vinci. These two scenes, Décalage and OK en Change, cue viewers how to watch not just the productions they introduce, but Lepage's original stage work overall. The small scale suggests and stands in for the large. Viewing is an active and ludic position. Travel, growth, and change are key themes and values. Meaning will be transmitted by the transformation of bodies and objects, which will be made to stand in for technologies and machines, like the airplane in Vinci, and for whole communities and cultures, like the street with the boxes and the girls in the Dragons trilogy. And, central to the argument here, the spatial montage of different strands of action suggests a metaphoric relationship between those strands, which advances plot and theme. This simultaneous overlapping of two narrative layers between which the storytelling toggles evokes graphical user interface in which computer users click, users click back and forth between different windows on the same screen. It is notable that Lepage started to craft theatrical techniques that evoked the same effects as graphical user interface in the early days of the contemporary digital age. The Dragons trilogy and Vinci date from the mid-1980s, which is when the first Macintosh computer became commercially available. A crucial difference, however, is that its production still remained ultimately controlled by Lepage's artistic choices. While spectators are given imaginative and emotional work to do in interpreting the relationship between the different levels of stage action, they cannot choose to, if you will, click on one or another of the representational frames and move it to the front themselves. As such, however, Lepage and other theater artists of his generation paved the way for the immersive and participatory theater practices that are currently on the ascendant in Western theater cultures. So to conclude, in this presentation, I've been arguing that thinking about Robert Lepage's theater productions as attempts to give spectators a cinematic experience will help us grasp his particular contribution to contemporary creative practices. By inviting us to use our skills in making sense of screened narratives, skills that many of us are probably not even aware that we have, even though we use them every day, Lepage crafted a, disti a distinct signature as a creator of live performance. Those of us who follow the theater performance and opera scenes are likely to agree that the influence and affects of that signature have had a major influence on the practices of subsequent generations. Meanwhile, the medial wheels continue to turn and the languages of the cinematic are increasingly being remediated and subsumed by those of the digital. Lepage's cinematic stage stories may soon start to look and feel dated, if they haven't already. What remains to be seen is whether this keen observer of and participant in the medial scene will transform his practices again in order to fully embrace the languages of the digital. Thank you.